Vegas Video Network Studios, just steps from the Las Vegas Strip, it's Top of the Food Chain. And now your host, he's one part mohawk, two parts attitude, and a touch of what the f***, it's Al Mancini. Yeah, Brandy's not clapping. Thanks, Brandy. Well, that really just, the whole show is going to be off now. But anyway, hey, welcome to Top of the Food Chain. I am your host, Al Mancini. And watching last week's show, I kind of thought, I am the liquid nitrogen of the food critique world. I am flashy as hell. I'm cooler than just about anything else out there. And if you ask a lot of people, my career is going to go up in a puff of smoke very quickly. <laughs> But anyway, welcome to Top of the Food Chain on the Vegas Video Network, the home of all your great Las Vegas webcasting, podcasting, all that interweb stuff that the kids are talking about these days. You can find tons and tons of programming on the Vegas Video Network at VegasVideoNetwork.com. All of our stuff is over at YouTube. We are on Roku. We are on iTunes, audio and video versions you can download. You listen to us every week at KSHP 1400 AM. Every Friday night, all of our programming just streamed one after another. You don't get to see the smoke and the mirrors, but you do get to hear all the pertinent facts, as they say in the business. Um, and also, my website is almancini.net. You can find all of the old programs, plus a bunch of other stuff that I'm doing at almancini.net. And follow me on Twitter, Al Mancini Vegas. In the meantime, if you have a question for a future show, you're going to want to email that to me at food at vegasvideonetwork.com. If you have a question right now and you're watching live, especially my friends on live stream, I understand we got a lot of people at live stream watching today. So if you are at live stream, go on and um, log in. We've got a chat room happening, and we'd love to take your questions. If you ever wanted to know anything at all about champagne and sparkling wine, we're going to have an expert here, Ken Shea, to teach you anything you ever needed to know about that in just a few minutes. Um, and what do we have? If you're listening on the radio and you want to call in a question for a future show, that is toll free. You will not have a toll. Does toll free even matter anymore when everybody's got unlimited calling? But it still is toll free. It's 866-966- four, five, nine, nine, and we will get to those questions in future shows. In the meantime, my buddy Scott, oh, actually before we get to Scott, we got to talk about our sponsor. I'm so thrilled. We've got a, we've got a new sponsor for the show. This is the second week. This is um, my friend Chris Heron over at Bread and Butter in Henderson. This is an incredible shop. I mean, you know, I love this show because I would only allow sponsors who I really, really like what they're doing over there. Chris is a former pastry chef from Bouchon. He now has this incredible kind of little neighborhood place just outside of Anthem on Eastern Avenue. Great sandwiches, great pastries. Um, just incredible. Seriously, if you are, um, you're looking for any kind of cookies, cakes, things like that for the holiday season, check out Bread and Butter. Um, I was just looking at his Facebook page today. He was making a brownie tree for somebody. I mean, just great stuff. So Bread and Butter, Chris and everybody at Bread and Butter, keep up the good work and thanks a lot for sponsoring the show. And now we'll get to the second most important person of the show, Mr. Scott. How are you? I am good, you flatterer, you. You're, you're on your own. Jacob's on vacation. Yes, Jacob is in jolly old England right now. He's uh, living the good life, drinking 15% uh, alcohol beer. I mean, you know, working for the Vegas Video Network's a pretty good life. It's got its perks. Did you fly him over there? Because I didn't get that invitation. Uh, no, I didn't. Because, uh, you know, I could tour the restaurants of jolly old England with Jacob. We could shoot some remote stuff. I will, let me check my notes, and uh, next time I send him, I will put that down at, hold on, right here. Al wants to go to England. Dot com. <laughs> <No>. Dot com. <laughs> I'm going to start a website for that. We'll see how much, how much of a response we get. So, Scott, everything going well, though? And I, know you're, I know you're busy working all the controls over there. You do have a little help, but I know you're missing Jacob, so I don't want to get too into this with you, but how's everything been this week? It's lonely. Yes. I miss my Jacob. And, and, and Melissa's not a little under the weather, so you've got no love going on. Oh, I get a little love. Okay, I hope this is not watching. I think you know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, well, speaking of a little love. That was and pathetic, by the way. I apologize to everybody watching. <laughs> I've got a story that I can't, can't break quite this week, but um, you know there are two, two human 
two things in human nature everybody needs, and that's good love and good food. And mm -hmm. hopefully by the time we're back after the new year, I'm going to go to a meeting right now over at one of my favorite restaurants, and we will be doing a porn star brunch during AVN week. I will be hosting it with some of my favorite ladies of porn. So guys, look forward to that. I'm going to have an announcement on that. That's what I've spent my week trying to accomplish, Scott. You need to get a real job. That's all there is to it. <laughs> my God. I, I, I believe most people with a real job would say they need to get a job where they get to try to put uh. chefs and porn stars in the same room and enjoy the fruits of their labor. OK. That's the way you put that made me a little sad. <laughs> anyway, we'll be talking about that hopefully when I come back. That's not finalized, but it's going to be a lot of fun during the Porn Awards. In the meantime, um, I, I always get questions about where people who don't eat out, or who, excuse me, who don't have family Christmas dinners, holiday dinners, or maybe people who don't celebrate Christmas, where should you go to eat on Christmas? We're going to get into that, some of my recommendations, um, in just a few minutes. So if you have questions, again, get on the chat line. But for now, we've got a quick message. Traditional media believes that after about three minutes, you'll tune out. He's Most gonna... Vegas media companies think if it doesn't <laughs> jiggle, you won't tune in. At the Vegas Video Network, <laughs> we think both are wrong. The Vegas Video Network is the first and only live online broadcast network that specializes in insider news and expert views about Vegas. We combine great storytelling with the ability to watch when and where you want on your computer, mobile device, or television. Discover the real Las Vegas. Visit VegasVideoNetwork.com. And we're back on top of the food chain at the Vegas Video Network. I'm your host, Al Mancini, and by golly, it is almost Christmas time. Ho, ho, ho. ho. Now, that goes ho, ho, ho's. That was my porn star story before. We're, that, we're out of the ho, ho, ho's story. Um, anyway, it's almost Christmas time. <laughs> I know a lot of, uh, Vegas is a town where a lot of people are transient. I mean, not transient, but a lot of people are from somewhere else. You move here from another place, and you, you may not always get home to the family every holiday. And for somebody who's a foodie like myself, Finding a really good place to have Christmas dinner is important if you're going to go out to dinner and you want something. For me, I like things that are seasonal. Christmas isn't quite like Thanksgiving where you have to have the turkey or you have to have the ham. A lot of things really say Christmas to me. But, of course, turkey and ham always work. Um, game meats, I love wild boar. If you could do it, venison. Eating Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer on Christmas is always fun. Um, you know, anything like that, a lot of... Um, you know, squash, win winter flavors. That's what I'm looking for in a good Christmas dinner. So this, this year, I put together on my website a list of about 20 Christmas menus. Because a lot of, by the way, you should worry, a lot of restaurants, you're going to want to call ahead and make sure they're open. In Vegas, most places will be open, but they're not always going to have their regular menus. For me, that's a very cool thing, because you get something you don't get the rest of the year. Um, but you want to know what they have. I put about 20 of what I think are some of the coolest menus in every price range, every type of food, together on my website. You can see it at almancini.net. Go check it out. But for now, I want to I spotlight the four that are really the ones that I'm torn between right now. And I did this in different price ranges. Starting off, we're going to go with um, the inexpensive. If you really want to get, do something Christmassy, do something a little special, but not spend a lot of money, and actually be casual. You know, maybe be able to bring five kids out and let them run around and have a good time and not worry about it. Um, KGB, Kerry's Gourmet Burgers. That's um, Kerry Simon's burger place over in, um, blah, where is that? That's in Harris. God, why do I always forget that's in Harris? I have somebody from Harris here with me today. KGB Burger, a great burger joint, one of the best here in town. Um, but it's doing some cool stuff. Kerry Simon over there, who, who's cooking I love, he's been on this show talking about burgers. He's doing some really cool stuff. Some of the things he put on the menu, and I've got notes here, sorry for looking down there. But um, you can start off with a cranberry apple salad, which is pretty cool. That's seven bucks, so there you go. For your entree, he's got a Christmas burger. It's a lamb burger, and it comes with a mint basil aioli. So that's, that's really combining a lot of your Christmas flavors there in a hamburger form. I mean, you've got the lamb, you've got a little bit of the gaminess there, and of course you've got the mint and the basil. And just really cr classic. And you're only going to spend 14 bucks on that, so you're not going to go broke. And then you, this, I'm going, I don't care where I eat, whether it's at Carrie's or someplace else, I'm doing this for dessert. Um, you wash it all down with an eggnog milkshake, and Carrie makes some incredible milkshakes over there. And that's garnished with nutmeg, nutmeg pecan brittle, and that's for five bucks. 
box. So you want to do something cool on Christmas Day that has a little bit of the holiday, but maybe you're running around Vegas, you got the kids, you want to hit the blackjack table, I don't know, but you want to keep it casual. That is really your inexpensive joint to go to. You want to kick it up a notch? Then we're going to go over to another friend of this show, um, Brian Howard at Come Sa, that's in the Cosmopolitan, and he's doing a three-course dinner for 49 bucks. And there's a, just a lot of holiday options that he has. You have choices in each of those three courses. Well, let me just run you down some of my favorites. I mean, you started off with um, a warm Bartlett pear and a goose. So it's the warm pear and a goose roulette, which is um, kind of like a charcuterie. It's a spread, a shredded, shredded meat spread with the pear and the goose. Very classic Christmas combinations. Um, main course, you've got um, spiced ham with sweet potato brulee. You can have butternut squash tortellini with vanilla roasted pumpkin. And that's in a sage butter, or you can have a, um, a salt baked striped bass. So, you know, these are really cool things. For dessert, you're getting liquid vanilla bourbon truffle with an eggnog froth. Yes, an eggnog froth and cinnamon pudding, plus an eggnog souffle. Three courses there, 49 bucks. Again, a little more money, but it's Christmas dinner. If you, can, if you could swing it, I think going over to Kamsa at the Cosmopolitan, a great way in that mid level. Now, if you want it, if you really want it, um, you know, pull out all the stops. I mean, I've, I've got dinners here in town that are as much as 350 but this one is an expensive dinner that I think is a great deal. It's at Valentino, generally an Italian restaurant, but a high-end Italian restaurant over in the Venetian. And they are doing five courses for 85 bucks. And I mean, I'm just going to run down what you're getting there. And this is Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It's available both days at Valentino. It starts with probably the least Christmassy thing on the menu. It's an octopus carpaccio with... Um, with, um, blah, what, am I, what am I thinking here? With sea urchin dressing. Sea ur I was trying to come up with uni. I was trying to be clever and use the Japanese name, but it's sea urchin. Uh, but then you really start getting into more traditional flavors. Bacon wrapped crab cake with a puttanesca sauce. Again, that Italian influence. But then here you go. Roasted goose ravioli with a truffle flavored custard sauce. I mean, goose, Christmas goose is just, you know, you're right up to Scrooge time there, you know, if you're doing that with a custard sauce. And then, um, a venison chop, like I said, I love game meats during Christmas time, and it's always cool to say that you got to eat Rudolph for Christmas. So you've got a venison chop as your fourth course, and then you're going to finish that off with a miniature bouche de Noël. And you're going to see this on a lot of the menus right now, the bouche de Noël. And that's basically just a Yule log, kind of a, a cake, a French cake that's one of those pinwheel sort of cakes, starts as a, a sheet cake, and then they wrap it around with the icing on the inside. Your mom probably made them, and it looks like a Yule log. Um, that's how you finish it off there. And that is at Valentino in the Palazzo, or excuse me, in the Venetian, not very far from the Palazzo. And finally, if you want to do something that's more of an Italian Christmas tradition, and anybody from southern Italy knows about the Feast of the Seven Fishes. And this is usually a Christmas Eve tradition that goes on, and it takes all night. And there's you know, seven completely different fish that, that you have. That can be a pain. Um, so what they're doing at Rayo's in Caesar's Palace, one of my absolute favorite restaurants in Las Vegas, um, they're doing a three-course version of the Feast of the Seven Fishes. There are at least seven or eight fish you can choose from over the course of your three courses, but you get three courses, and it's 65 bucks. And Rayo's is amazing. It's a restaurant that is set up to look like it's Christmas all year round, so you can only imagine what it looks like when they actually have to put up real Christmas decorations. This is where I had Christmas Eve dinner two years ago. I did this Feast of the Seven Fishes. They've changed chefs since then, but the woman who is in the kitchen now, Nicole Grimes, she's been in the kitchen from the day it started. She assisted the former chef. When the former chef took these seven fishes, on Bobby Flay and kicked Bobby's ass. So that's the kind of tradition they have at Rayo's for doing Feast of the Seven Fishes. They took down Bobby Flay. Again, slight change in chefs, but you're still in incredible hands over there. I love Rayo's. And these, any one of these places, I would be thrilled to personally go for Christmas dinner. We've got them in all price ranges, a little bit of something for everything, depending on how snobby you want to be, how much you want to dress up. If you want more choices, again, I've picked out another 15 or so of really, really, what I believe to be really, really good choices. And you can find them all at almancini.net. I don't care where you go. I hope you're with family. If you're not with family, I hope you go out and have a really good time with someone you love or someone you lust after or, I don't know, get a hooker if you don't have anybody else. But um, have a great Christmas dinner. We're going to be back and talk more about celebrating with a little bit of champagne and sparkling wine in just a minute. 
Oh, hello there. My name is Brandon Gooch Han, host of Awkward Silence 2.1. And when I'm not living vicariously through Chris Phillips, I'm on VegasVideoNetwork.com. I still haven't made it down to check out Gooch's show. I'm a little bummed about that. One of the newest stars of the Vegas Video Network. Great local radio personality, too. And I've seen his shows. You should definitely check him out. I've watched him online, but I want to be here live for the madness. Scott, is it madness when Gooch is on the air? Yes, it is madness. <laughs> and it, but the cool thing is, everybody behind the camera is naked. Why don't we do that for my show? Because uh, <laughs> the people that I invite eat and drink too much, and they don't look quite as good naked. Yeah, I'll bring the porn stars down maybe for the show that week. <laughs> Um, anyway, welcome back, Top of the Food Chain on the Vegas Video Network. I am joined today by Ken Shea, who I just met a week or so ago. Ken, how are you? Doing great, Al. Doing great. Thanks Thank so you. much for coming down to talk, man. Thanks for having me on. Ken is um, sommelier at the Range Steakhouse in Harris, and we spoke, I spoke about this on the air last week. I never knew this place existed. It's kind of hidden away up on the second floor, and um, you know your publicist was kind enough to have my wife and myself down. And I mean, beautiful room, incredible view, great food. I mean, an onion soup like I've never had before. I mean, incredible, and an incredible wine selection. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. We try to keep it varied. We try to keep uh, uh, taste available for those who want stronger, richer wines, lighter styles, uh, a little bit for everything: dry, sweet, heavy, light. Try to mix it up. Well, for me, it's important having a great sommelier like yourself because I, I try to know a little bit about everything, you know, a little bit about tequilas, a little bit about champagne, a little bit. But wine is one of those topics that you can't know just a little bit about. And I always feel like a fish out of water in these super fine restaurants if I don't have a great sommelier kind of guiding me through it and, and walking me and not making me feel stupid. And I, I always try to explain to people, you know, we had a... Um, uh, Lindsay Whipple on here to discuss what sommeliers do, Lindsay from Cut, and we tried to get it across to people. We shouldn't, people shouldn't be afraid of their psalms, right? No, no. We're, we're there to help, and uh, we just want to make it easier for you to pick out the kind of wine or bubbly that makes you the happiest. That's what we need to do. That's what we should be doing. Okay. Well, we're, I had you down here because it's time for celebration. People are out buying last-minute gifts right now, and they're going to be buying last-minute New Year's presents and stocking up for parties. And, of course, sparkling wines and champagne, it's just its synonymous with this time of year. It, probably more is sold this time of year than, you know, in these three weeks than in, you know, the other 49 weeks combined. Did I do the math right on how many weeks there are in a year? Uh, hey, close enough, yeah. close enough, <laughs> um, my friend, yes. 49, 352, yeah, yeah, I got that one. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I want to start with the simplest question, because I always find the simplest questions are the ones that people go, wow, that, oh, how did I not know that? But it's so, it's such an easy answer, and yet it'll still intimidate, I don't know, half the people out there. What's the difference between a champagne and a sparkling wine? A couple of factors involved. Champagne should be traditionally from the Champagne district of France. And that's where the light bulb goes off. Like, oh, Champagne is from Champagne. Just northeast of Paris. Not really tough once you know that. The cognac's from the cognac region. And, Absolutely. You know, the, the French are very picky. The Europeans in general, designations of origin, they take rather seriously. They do. You, I mean, it's against the law to call something champagne if you're not making it in the Champagne region. Basically, in the early 1900s, the French made phone calls to various parts of the world where sparkling wines were being made. In this country, there was champagne printed right across the labels of a number of uh, properties. And they said, uh, hey, you know, we would like you to stop using champagne because that's what we feel is only ours. And at that time, I think it was around 1918, 1920, when Prohibition hit, right around the early 1900s, our people said, hey, look, we're in Prohibition. We don't make that stuff, so <laughs> forget about it. We don't have to even answer this request. Right. So today, you still see champagne on 
quite a number of American labels, it, especially the inexpensive stuff. It does, it does kind of make Americans look bad, though, that we're the only ones that don't seem to respect that. Like, we're, we'll call it champagne. <laughs> what the, the hell? It's not like, I mean, could you imagine if some French company started putting the words Kentucky bourbon on their whiskeys? I mean, Americans would be up in arms, but we don't seem to think twice about putting the word champagne on it. Yeah, I guess you could say there's a little bit of an attitude involved, <laughs> just a little. But amongst, now you say especially the inexpensive stuff, because I, I would assume amongst the fine wine community of which you are a prominent member, you don't look kindly on, you wouldn't look kindly on a good vineyard in America putting the word champagne on their bottle, would you? Well, it just doesn't seem right. It just doesn't seem appropriate. Because even though I'm not you know, ultra traditional, it still seems as if, it, if it's going to be champagne, it should come from that French zone. Uh, and besides, there are so many great sparkling wines made throughout the world right. that should be known as sparkling wine. And then you can take a look at where they're coming from and just tack it on to that and appreciate it for that. Well, American wines, of course, are no longer considered second-class wines. I mean, we no. have a lot of, you know, New World wines have gotten a lot more respect in the past, I don't know, 40, 50 years. I don't know when they started getting respect, but they definitely are respected now. Are American sparkling wines... Do they get any, re are there really high quality American sparkling wines out there? There are quite a few high quality American sparkling wines. Some of these operations are involved with their sister houses from France, from the Champagne Zone. Uh, I, I used to buy a Moet um, out of California that yeah. was very inexpensive or very reasonably priced. And that's the sister house of Moet and Chandon, that's right? That's the California side in Napa of the sister house for Ch Moet Chandon Champagne in right. France. Uh, the Chandon operation does a very consistent job, and they have a great lunch for those of you who uh, <laughs> enjoy the lunch out there, too. If, um, if somebody's out there, let's say somebody's on a big Buy American kick, right? And they, I don't know, they're still mad about something about the French. Americans are always mad at the French for something. What would you say would be the, the highest? What would be the Dom Perignon of American sparkling? I, I'm not saying it would compare to a Dom or a Cristal or, you know, a Le Grand Dom or something like that, but what would be the... The, the top of the line American sparkling wine. I don't want to upset anybody in particular by naming one or two or three and not naming some others, but one of my favorites for a long time has been the Rotorer operation in Mendocino County. Their L'Hermitage Brut is very, very tasty stuff. It's a nice, rich style. Uh, hazelnut, honey notes, uh, just enough fruit kicks through, uh, great finish. It's, it's, it's terrific from start to finish, it really is. And uh, it, it's up there a bit in price, but uh, you know, not what quite as much as- What would you in a restaurant for that? In a restaurant, uh, you should be in a uh, ooh, 70, 80, 90 zone, right about okay. there. Still pretty reasonable. Which is st still under what most really good French champagnes are going to sell for. Yeah, I mean, if that's, if that's one of the top of the line Americans, I mean, you know, I would pay that for just vu. Right? I mean, Clicquot, which I always mispronounce. How, how bad did I mangle that? No, you did it just fine. <laughs> right. Clicquot, that was beautiful. Um, yeah, Veuve Clicquot, which of course has higher versions, but if you just take their base, I'm probably paying more than that than I am paying for the American that you just mentioned. Yeah, the Yellow Label Brut, which is probably the most called for champagne in this country right now, uh, is, it's always flowing. It's always flowing. People just, oh, just give me a bottle of Veuve. You know, right. There's no questions asked. It's, and it's an automatic. They probably mispronounce it quite a bit. And they do. Yes. <laughs> worst, worst mispronunciation you've ever had for <laughs> Vive Clico? Uh, uh, I had a guy come in one time and call it Vive Clico. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's just a little bit off, but hey. No, not so bad. I want to get into some history, but well, for one thing, this is the longest we've ever done a show without having alcohol poured, right, Scott? Yes, I'm not happy right now. Yeah, I, I knew you were getting <laughs> upset. And uh, no, it's, it's a little important to me that we actually do pour some alcohol in this show because. Knowing how to open a bottle of sparkling wine or champagne or cava, as the Spanish call it, mm. right? Another good term you're going to want to know if you see cava, that's basically just Spanish sparkling wine. Yep, good and expensive stuff. Yeah. Yes. Um, some. Close, close, close. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I meant some, some is good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of it's inexpensive. Um, but opening a bottle of champagne that scares a lot of people they, they think they're going to kill somebody i mean you you hear these rumors it's like a cannon going off and you'll be you can knock out light bulbs you can get shot in the head and so i want to go over the 
the better way, because a lot of people like to shoot it and then it goes spewing out in a very phallic way and um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, then you waste all your champagne. So I want to talk about opening it, but the very first thing, storing it, because I've had two things happen. The most recent, my brother who doesn't drink had everybody up to his suite at the Cosmopolitan for, um, for Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. And he had picked up some bottles of halfway decent, I think champagne actually, and bec it was warm because he went to Lee's or something to get it. And, and it was rolling around in the car It was rolling around afternoon. the car. And then he decided to throw it into the little freezer section because he thought that would quick, you know, chill it. And of course, when it popped, there was nothing left to drink because everything was all over. All over the ceiling. All over the Vegas Strip because we were out on the balcony. <laughs> oh. So best way to, to um, store it so that you don't have that problem. Most people don't store champagne for that long. It's usually bought for an almost upfront, immediate occasion. Uh, if you want to hold it for a good while, just try and keep it at uh, a nice steady 60 degrees like you would do with red wines, like you would do with white wines. Um, what if you buy it warm off the shelf and you want to be able to drink it that day? How do you chill it? If I may say, try not to buy it off of a shelf that might be in somebody's front window where the sun's been shining in from time to time. Mm -hmm. Doesn't help it at all. No. <laughs> uh, but Put it in a refrigerator uh, for at least an hour and a half. Uh, I would generally go at least three hours. Uh, depending on how much you have in your refrigerator, it might take a little bit longer, a little bit less time for it to chill. And don't do the freezer thing. But uh, yeah, try to avoid the freezer. I know some people who store their um, bubblies in their refrigerator for months and months and months, if not longer. And as the, the cork, the uh, stopper stays in the bottle for all that amount of time, they shrink. And then you have bubbles escaping as that cork shrinks. Right. So you don't want to keep them in the refrigerator too long if you can. Right. Okay. And that's why I guess you generally would um, you store it on its side so that the cork stays wet and doesn't shrink as much, right? Uh, that's Does fine. That help that's no? fine. Uh, I've stored them on the side. I've stored them standing up. <laughs> uh, still but I always just uh, lie them on their side for a little bit at a time and then put them back standing up so that the corks do stay moist. Okay, so could you demonstrate how the, the proper way, because this is, this is hard, harder than opening a condom wrapper when you're in a hurry, I mean, getting into this stuff when you want to drink. <laughs> I mean, it's, these things are pretty hardcore. Well, you just have to be mildly careful. And uh, I'll grab a bottle here, hopefully I'm not uh, losing the camera. But, uh, oh, let's see what we got here. Chartonia Taille Champagne, okay. out of France. I'll stand here if that's okay for the camera. Actually, sit down. Sit down, okay, okay. I'm sure uh, my boss at work, uh, J.P. Terezi, would not be happy if I was sitting down opening a bottle in front of a guest, but this is quite fine for you. <laughs> this here. is fine anyway, for us. <laughs> basically, what you're going to do is you will slide your thumb around where the, the pin is. You'll pull off the, uh, the wrapper, although you don't really have to do that. But it looks cleaner this way. Right. Put your forefinger on top of that cork. Hold it like this. And now you have If I this, was at a table, I'd be this. having the, the, the label face the guest. And you have this twisted metal, which is really just to prevent these bottles from popping. Exactly. Right? And the reason they've got to have these on there is because there is about six atmospheres of pressure inside this bottle. That's about the amount of pressure that you've got in a truck tire. Wow. So if you pop that truck tire, you're going to... Boy, it's going right. to be heavy duty. Okay. Unscrew it. It's usually about six turns. There we go. Loosen it up a little bit. Hold it from the bottom, keeping your finger up on the top. And very slowly, you'll feel, you'll feel right away when that, once that wire releases what the pressure's. Don't even have to turn it much. It's already forcing itself right. out. So you don't want to hear that pop that everyone's so excited about. <sighs> Unless you just I, won the Super Bowl or something, there's no reason to shoot champagne off. Like I that. kind of enjoy a little bit of the pop, but I used to work with a Turkish maitre d' many, many years ago who just didn't want to hear it. it. Sounded like a gun going off in a room, even though I kept it down to about a three on a 10 scale. Right, but, <laughs> but the more of that pop, the more you're going to have the champagne spill out, right? Yeah, generally speaking, that can happen sometimes. Yeah. But with this one here, there was a lot of pressure in it. So the cork was forcing itself up on, on its own. So I, normally I would have been turning it, rotating it this way until the cork loosened up and mm -hmm. pulled itself up. 
Okay. Okay. Force itself up. So can we try this? Absolutely. And while we do, um, let's talk, uh, if you don't mind pouring, you're the professional. I'm oh, going to pour it wrong. Do. You know that'll happen. Oh, you um, can. But so we're using wine glasses here. We don't have any flutes, and we don't have those, um, those thin champagne-y kind of glasses that people are using. Or not thin, excuse me, those flat, short champagne glasses. Mm -hmm. um, Nobody seems to use them anymore, the, the, the short little ones. The They're saucers. Like the, the saucers, the yeah. The saucers. The saucers that are supposed to be the shape of Marie Antoinette's breast, I was once told. Quite true. <laughs> but no. we don't use them anymore. We use flutes for the most part now? Most everybody wants to use the flutes because they love to see the bubbles streaming up the side of the glass. Bubbles, merriment. Uh, it's a sign of, uh, of joy and happiness, I guess, for many people. How about taste-wise? What kind of glass works best to make it taste? I love it in a slightly or more rounded glass. Like this, possibly just a touch smaller, but this is a great glass to do it because I love to swirl them. You, so it's okay like to I, swirl champagne? Oh yeah, just like I would do with wine. You know, it, it'll give you the beautiful aroma. You'll see what's going on in there. And that's it, because you can get your nose into a glass. You can I mean, get your nose it, into Make it simple. I Absolutely. can get my big old nose into this. I can't get my nose into a flute. <laughs> Those things are skinny, so you no don't, way you don't get happen. any nose off of it in a flute. No way that's gonna happen. Well, cheers. Absolutely, happy holidays, Al. Thank you. Wow, that's good. Boy, that's got, Chartonia Taille is uh, medium, medium plus, sort of bubbly, mm -hmm. on the richness scale. And it's got that nice biscuity, almost honey-like aroma and flavor, uh, with a nuttiness coming through as well. Uh, and what would a bottle like nice that dryness, cost Nice dryness. Either in a Lees or in a good restaurant? It should be in and around 50 bucks. In a Lees, like in a, yeah. in a retail store? in and store. around 50 or so. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Nice, and then you get to call it Champagne, because it is from the Champagne region of France. Absolutely, and for those who are curious about little tidbits of information, especially for the ladies out there, it was Benjamin Franklin back in the 1700s who did state, Champagne is the only liquor a lady can drink and still remain a lady. So, and yet interestingly and they enough, knew, they said he knew a lot about the ladies. And interestingly enough, the porn stars that I hang out with love to drink champagne, uh -huh. so they are true ladies. So, um, <laughs> and Marilyn, I just Mon had to go with that, Scott. I just know you enjoy <laughs> hearing about them so much. <laughs> Legend has it that Marilyn Monroe used to take baths in 350 bottles of champagne. I have heard those stories, and I'm just curious what the bubbles did for her. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, who needs a jacuzzi, really? You know, <laughs> Better than a jacuzzi. <laughs> right. Uh, could you give me a little, give everyone, a, please, a little history on champagne and, and how it works, where these bubbles come from, so to speak? Champagne goes through a double fermentation. Uh, think of making a regular wine, white or red, uh, main, the main grapes being Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and or Pinot Meunier, another red grape. So you got two red grapes sometimes with the, with the Pinot Meunier and the white Chardonnay. And they'll ferment them and it'll turn into a, eventually, you know, a, a, a wine looking like product. And then the, the fluid will be injected a second time, placed in a bottle after the, the initial fermentation, placed in a bottle with another, uh, kick of sugar and uh, yeast, which will then re-ferment because it takes yeast and sugar to create that fermentation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the basic formula for wine. Yeast and sugar equals a carbon dioxide and alcohol. Right. Now, now, so then so we you, get into... That's where I wanted to get. So if, when you ferment a wine, mm -hmm. a normal wine, you're still giving off carbon dioxide, but yes. it's not in a sealed bottle, right. so you don't get the bubbles. Exactly. So what they're doing is making the same process happen, mm -hmm. but all of that carbon dioxide, which would normally just go up into the atmosphere, is stuck in the wine. It doesn't have any space. It, it can't expand, so it has to be pressurized, and it builds up this pressure and releases in the bubbles when the, it's exactly. released. Exactly. Kind of, I remember taking physics in high school. I don't remember re much about remember it. remember it well. <laughs> thank you. We've got a question. Scott. Yeah, what is Prosecco? Prosecco ah. is the grape. Prosecco is a dry sparkling wine from either the Veneto in northeastern Italy or Friuli. You, I you call it a dry sparkling wine. I've had some very sweet Prosecco. You can do some sweet as well. Generally speaking, we usually drink it dry, but it can be sweet as well. Absolutely. And talking just about a few other Good types, like what about an Asti Spumante? That, that's a sparkling wine, right? That's in, a, that's in Italian, but that's much sweeter, right? It's going to be, a, in general, it's going to be a tad sweeter. 
And just for the record, um, originally when champagnes were made uh, with the real bubble action going on, uh, after they were originally dry red wines, and they got away from that uh, in the uh, 1600s, 1700s, uh, you've got demi-sec, which is pretty moderately sweet for champagne. Mm -hmm. Then you've got sec, which is just a little less sweet. And then you've got extra dry, which they named for very slightly sweet mm. uh, champagnes. And then you've got brut, which is pretty dry, pretty doggone dry, just a hint of sweetness, barely at all. And then you've got ultra brut for really, really bone dry type champagnes. Brut tends so, to be the, most, the one I hear most about. Brut is most often the one you see out there on the tables, yes. When we talk about sweetness, I, I want to move because you brought, you brought a nice rosé champagne mm -hmm. up here for us. And there we go. It's right out there. Um, a lot of people believe if they get a rosé champagne, it's going to be sweeter. Is there any correlation with the color and the, the sugar content? Not really. There's a lot of rosé champagnes out there. There's a lot of rosés made in other countries that are nice and dry, very fragrant. You tend to get that nice red berry, almost cherry-like fruit coming out of them, sometimes a little bit of a hint of raspberry. But they show really, really well. And the great thing about rosés is they'll go a lot better with a steak than will a regular brute champagne okay. made from, or Blanc de Blanc made from Chardonnay. Well, that's good to know if you're going out for a steak. Um, I, I had another quick question about pairing. Oh, people always tend to think champagne, of course, is going to go best with caviar. And champagne is, you know, and they always name ultra luxury items. Is that just because people like to spend a lot of money when they're spending money? Or does it, do they really pair together? Well, I guess because they usually can afford to pay for the caviar itself, especially <laughs> if it's beluga, they can usually afford to spend big bucks on products like Laurent Perrier Grand Sillac, Clico, La Grande Dame, some of the, you know, the bigger, bigger champagne right. names. Of course, Dom Perignon is in there. Louis Rotor or Cristal is in there. Well, okay, we, we have to run really quickly, but so, okay, you don't have to do the, the, um, the caviar. What if, um, if you want to have some decent, nice sparkling wine at your holiday party, mm -hmm. what kind of snack foods would you say pair well with it? Well, match texture with texture. The lighter, crisper styles of champagne, and there are plenty of, plenty of them, uh, any of your light appetizers would work terrifically well. Uh, the slightly richer champagnes would work great with chicken, with white wine sauces, say a morel mushroom sauce, okay. uh, anything like that. Okay, well, that sounds good. I hope everyone out there is going to get some nice sparkling wine and or champagne in your Christmas stocking this year. Um, or in any kind of stocking, just stick it in a stocking. It doesn't have to be a Christmas stocking. It's, <laughs> but I, I want to thank you so much, Ken, for coming down. Again, it was great meeting you at the, um, the Range Steakhouse last week. Uh, great discovering that place. I didn't even know it existed. You, you gave us some wonderful wines. I think you did a nice Shiraz for me, actually. And um, it was great. So th thank you so very much for coming down. I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks so much, Al. I wish everybody else out there a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. We will be taking a week off. Um, because it's the holidays and Scott needs a little vacation. So we're going to be taking a little time off. I will be back in the new year with some great shows, really excited about some of the projects that are coming up. In the meantime, you need a last minute stocking stuffer for somebody? Eating Las Vegas, the 50 essential restaurants. It fits really well in one of those Christmas stockings. I know that Barnes & Noble still has it right here in Las Vegas, and if you want to give it to somebody late, you can order it at Amazon. I think it's on sale there for like 10 bucks and change. Follow me at almancini.net or on Twitter at almancinivegas. This has been Top of the Food Chain. Have a great holiday.